Hey everyone, this is Mike from Beyond the Lead. So the upcoming episode is a special episode entirely devoted to discussing the new atheists, which are Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, and Richard Dawkins. Recently in publications as varied as the farleftsalon.com and the assuredly right National Review, there have been pieces calling the new atheists dead, and also asking why has the left abandoned them? For the listener who isn't schooled in the New Atheist debate, we explain who these people are and we summarize their main arguments and why they're controversial. However, we hope that we opened up the discussion enough to of interest to most people who are listening. We will return to the regularly scheduled program next week. Welcome to, to Beyond, Beyond the, the Lead, Lead, where two young thinkers discuss current events and big ideas. This podcast provides in-depth analysis, along with free-flowing discussions about politics, philosophy, foreign policy, psychology, and many other fields you need to know about. Here's your hosts, Mike and Patrick. Hey everyone, this is Patrick. You can find me at Patrick F.O. on Twitter, and I have a blog, and it's at icriticaltheory.wordpress.com. What's up, Mike? Hey, what's going on, Patrick? Not much. You can find me tweeting at Mike Skinner with three N's, Mike, S-K-I-N-N-N-E-R. So as we mentioned, this episode is going to be slightly different, but... It's still going to be really good. (laughs) It's still going to be really, really good. So... I saw a great stand-up comedian named Joey Diaz a couple of weeks ago, and then you were like, I have to one-up you, man, because you saw Joe Rogan. How was that? That was one of the greatest, um, honestly, one of the better, better shows I've ever been to in my life, and I've never been to a comedy show. So, right, right. Um, you know, as a musician, I've, I've been and I've performed a whole bunch of shows, but comedy is just, it's something completely different. The atmosphere is completely different. It was something that I really enjoyed, and Joe Rogan, amazing. You guys need to go... Just go watch Powerful Joe because he is he's one of the best, in my opinion. I'm, yeah, uh, go watch his, his latest uh, stand-up special on Netflix called Triggered. It's really, mm-hmm. really good. It really is, and I want to point out that during that set, some girl behind me got triggered, so it was, right. it, it was awesome. <laughs> it was so great, but um, one thing right. I did wanted to say just real quick that I, I liked about Joe, he kind of like, he brought up kind of a lot of how hard it is to do comedy, and it kind of made me sad in a way that he had to almost apologize in a way for saying offensive things when I just, I think that could be the death of comedy, but that's a, right. that's a whole, whole rabbit hole we could get into sometime. But anyways, I just wanted to make that note real quick. Right. So speaking of being triggered, well, there has been a couple of pieces <laughs> from the last week all about how the new atheists are gone. They are extinct. There's a piece in the national review called whatever happened to the new atheist by Elliot Kaufman, who's an, um, an editor there. The reason that the National Review piece was written was because UC Berkeley disinvited Richard Dawkins to a talk because of uh, hurtful tweets he said about Muslims on Twitter. And uh, so the radio station that, that originally actually invited Richard Dawkins, KF, or sorry, KPFA in Berkeley, which is a listener-supported radio station in Berkeley, they asked Dawkins for a response, and he said that people should have the freedom to listen to whoever they choose to. And I think that might be the first time I actually heard freedom to listen like as a phrase. That's and a good point, actually. <laughs> I haven't no, really but heard that either. I think it's really important because people like people have the right to listen to whoever they want to listen to, and if you don't like them, just don't show up. Again, right. you can protest, but to force to force a station that already invited them um, to disinvite someone is right. ridiculous. And I just like that. I like the freedom of the freedom to listen is part of freedom of speech as well. So his response Yeah, I agree. That's, was, that's, that's one of the most interesting phrases. I mean, I didn't think about that, actually, but I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, I, liked, like, I like it a lot. And so he was asked about, about um, his tweets, and he said, Far from attacking Muslims, I understand, as perhaps you do not, that Muslims themselves are the prime victims of the oppressive cruelties of Islamism, especially Muslim women. Um, so that's just that, that Dawkins' response to UC Berkeley disinviting him. Um, so we should say a little bit about who the new atheists are, I think, and we can start with Richard Dawkins, actually. Sure. Um, so Richard Dawkins is an evolutionary biologist, and he's been writing books since the 70s. And I actually, I actually looked up. So he he's written 14 books, and only mm. one of them are directly about re- is directly about religion. Yeah. So it's like you know, it's <laughs> it's less That's than seven percent of his books are about um, are about religion directly, um, and and. Uh, Elliot Kaufman here from the, from the National Review says, so he sums up Dawkins' view 
in mm, two sentences and he says Richard Dawkins sees God as a complex super being subject to natural evolution and then deems him to be statistically improbable he may be right but why he thinks he has in the process critiqued anything resembling religion is beyond me <laughs> yeah. So that's where we can start talking about Dawkins. Sure, sure, yeah. So I have to say of the four, which um, I can just lay out real quick who all, all four new atheists sure. are, even though we're going to concentrate on, on Richard Dawkins. The other one is, is Christopher Higgins, Sam Harris, and Daniel Dennett. Now, of the four, uh, D Dawkins is actually my least liked one. I don't okay. like him as much as I like the other ones. I just Maybe it's just his how harsh and brash he is. I, I think I appreciated it in my initial angry atheist phase, I guess. Yes. But now I guess I just don't – I think a lot of it has to do with kind of trying to open my mind to more about religious belief instead of just critiquing it based on what it is in the scripture. So – uh, give for instance like Jordan Peterson's recent talks about the psychological significance of the Bible it just really makes me think that they're I just don't think that R uh, Richard Dawkins really wants to go into the nuances of of actual religious belief he just wants to critique everything based on on you know on the words which is which is fine and I think needs to be done it's just not um, an approach that I think is is as effective as what the other three do which is a lot more I think is like informed argument and laying out uh, their logical I'm sorry just using their lo logical arguments I just I, Richard Dawkins uses logic of course but I just don't think I, I don't like his approach as much and I, I think actually his other books and it's uh, it's true that they're all the other ones are just about evolutionary biology basically they're, to me they're really boring I mean that's just my own that's my right. own view I, I kind of liked The Greatest Show on Earth which is yeah but that one was pretty good. But overall, I just I couldn't really get into him. I found them pretty dry. Like they, I think I can see why people do like him. But I just want to say, of the four, he's kind of my least liked. I, I I respect him, especially for his contributions to science. I just I think actually I just want to end with saying I think he's a lot more important as a scientist and as a science writer than he as than he is as a new atheism communicator. Right, I agree with that. Um, I actually really really like his book called The Selfish Gene from 1976. Um, it and it's not, again, like the title, because it's called the selfish gene, people look way too much just into the title and they think that it means, it means that we should be like selfish actors in the world. Right. And he, he actually writes in the book, like, just because uh, um, evolution by way of natural selection, um, which, is, which does focus on the gene's eye view of reality, basically, but he goes, just because like genes are selfish doesn't mean that we should organize our society in that way. And everyone always focused on the title, of, you know, the title was so sort of anti-society and that wasn't, that's not the case. That's not the point of the book at all. And yeah, he really influenced my early 20s regarding evolution yeah. more, more than religion. And I feel like that is, mm -hmm. as, as, as you said, his, his reputation has taken a turn for the worse as of late. And I don't remember his tweets about Muslims specifically, and they're actually hard to find. I try to find them again. They're hard uh -huh. to find. Um, but he I do could have. I, I know that he deleted some tweets that he had gotten called out for, so he may just delete them to avoid the controversy. Which honestly, right. I don't blame him. Right. I don't really well, like that. I think you should stand by what you say. But and I'm not Richard Dawkins with a hundred million people watching me. So right. And I <laughs> yeah, I always just feel like like the. Uh, the few tweets that I have caught, I'm always like, why did you just tweet that? Like, there's no purpose to it. Um, but he does. His little just jabs, you know what I mean? Like, his, right. yeah, 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 I know what he you mean. He just has jabs, and that's mm -hmm. fine. I'm pro Which jabs, I like, I guess. yeah, I know. I, I'm cool <laughs> but, with it. I just, I don't think it's as effective as as it could be, I guess. I think if he concentrated more on the evolution in the science instead of just uh, his harsh critiques at religion, I think he'd be better at that. But Right. And uh, I do, I do actually think he critiques so this this Kaufman from the National Review piece he does he does make a point that he's like Dawkins is not actually critiquing religion but he is he does critique uh, monotheistic conceptions of God and he does even break down some of the more um, sophisticated arguments like like St. Thomas Aquinas has those seven proofs to that yeah. God exists and he doesn't I think the, the, he doesn't take them down in like a scholarly sco uh, way so he's not that sophisticated in doing it, but they're not like complicated arguments in themselves. True. And, uh, and that is one of the big arguments about all of the new atheists um, is that they don't take religion serious enough. And right. I like agree and I disagree. I'm with you. Uh, and, like, 
and especially especially Hitchens, which we can, which we can get into next, I, I, I suppose. Um, Hitchens' book is called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, and that came out in 2007. Mm-hmm. And Coffin here says that Hitchens offers no real argument and plenty of historical inaccuracies. I'm just going to pause there. That so, historical inaccuracies is a uh, part that I really strongly question because yeah. w- one of my favorite works was uh, is when he talks about Thomas Paine and the founders. And I was looking up and I couldn't find anyone besides some like maybe a, f- a few detractors, but I couldn't find anyone saying he was actually historically inaccurate in any of those. I remember Robert Wright one time said that um, Hitchens, that that, that that book is a is a collection of anecdotes. And it's like, well, all sort of popular books are almost like that because they're not like there there's not they're not there's not like a um a methodology section a epistemology section you know the like research section and right. it's a little unfair again it's it's not a piece of it is more like a polemical um opinionated book yeah. but it's it's not like he gets history wrong i mean he's he's might be the most well read person i've ever seen Exactly. Yeah, like, if there's one thing you can critique about Hitchens, it is definitely not his understanding of history and right. his just understanding of, uh, yeah, history. That, that sorry, and but uh, I, th- I, like I, he, he, you can critique him for a few things. Maybe just some of his life, you know, some of his maybe his habits. You can critique him for his strong, uh, you know, he, he voted or I don't know if he voted. He, I don't think he could, but he was a staunch advocate of the Iraq War. So there, there are things I think you can critique, but his historical inaccuracy, that to me was ridiculous. Yeah, so I think Hitchens' big problem with, with religion is that it doesn't allow us to know ourselves. And he believes that religion is anti-human, yeah. anti-progress, sexist, anti-secular, racist even he actually brings up the racism of 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 religion a lot because it's tribalism yes and and a uh, lot of the uh, well and a lot of the anti-semitism in christianity right and islam right um and he has a great few a few sentences in god is not great that i feel like when i first read i was like yep this is it like this is all you need to debate to take down religion (laughs) uh i think i might i might disagree a little bit now but it's still hard to it's still hard to completely disagree so his sentence his his the quote is there still remains four irreducible objections to religious faith one that it wholly misrepresents the origins of man and the cosmos you can pause there mm-hmm. uh it's hard to debate that point um we are not special in the cosmos we happen to be alive on a tiny rock floating through space in a in a not substantial part of the universe <laughs> right um, and like uh, and it, it it's just hard to, to to disagree with that. And then he goes on to say, and because of this original error, religion manages to combine the maximum of servility with the maximum of solipsism, and that also is also just a, a well written sentence and also hard to disagree with. And then he says mm-hmm. that it is both the result and the cause of dangerous sexual repression, and that it is ultimately grounded on wish thinking. And that is what makes that is what pisses off religious people because it's not it's not sophisticated and he just destroyed it in two sentences and it's hard to disagree. Yeah, and no, I, I totally I totally agree. That's the hardest thing about him is that he is actually he is able to take extremely complex things and just like bam, give it to you in two sentences and you just it kind of takes you a second to be like, oh wow, you, you got to think about how profound that was that he actually said. Um, I actually have a quote from him as well that um I think really kind of explains. I guess you just say where my kind of drift away from religion came from him. I guess uh, if I could say one of my biggest influences from him, I found this. I believe this was from a, it was either from a debate that he had done or it could have been writing. It's so hard to tell. He's so like right. eloquent with his writing. I'm sorry, with his speaking that you could basically like you could uh, read it as a transcript and think it was an essay. That's true. Whereas right. me, me or so you know unprofessional right. people, we say um and pauses and all these. But he said. Let's say the consens- Let's say that the consensus is that our species, we being the higher primates, Homo sapiens, have been on the planet for at least a hundred thousand years. In order to be Christian, you have to believe that for ninety-eight thousand years of our species, they suffered and died. Most of our children dying in childbirth. Most people had life expectancy of twenty-five years. Some dying from their own teeth. 
They struggled through famine and war and suffering and misery and all of that for 98,000 years. Heaven sits and watches with complete indifference. And then 2,000 years ago thinks, well, enough of that. It's time to intervene. The best way to do this would be by condemning someone to a human sacrifice somewhere in the less literate parts of the Middle East. Let's not appear to the Chinese, for example, where they can read and study evidence and have a civilization. Let's go to the desert and have another revelation. This is nonsense. This cannot be believed by a thinking person. That to me just sums up almost everything, everything that has to do with religion, in my personal opinion. Yeah, I agree. That's a really awesome Hitchin piece that I do remember reading or or listening to him say. Right. Uh, it, yeah, and, yeah, it's hard to tell be, what, but yeah. What I always really, really find admi- like admirable, and I, what I get motivated by is when I hear um, writers and. Um, give speeches about their books and are about you know anything and I've never heard Hitchens you shouldn't say never if I listen I've listened to hours and hours of Hitchens talk right. he, he almost never repeats anything like more than once and that's incredible he'll talk for hours and hours about about the same topics even and he never repeats the same arguments because he's so rehearsed well read right. and it, he I heard someone give a um like a vigil about him whenever he passed away a few years ago and he's like i don't think hitchens ever forgot any word he ever he, he has ever read <laughs> yeah. and i'm like yeah like that's what it seems like he's just quoting from shakespeare mm-hmm. and everyone right like no that's true uh, and like even people who were super religious that's not something they critiqued him about was his intellect or his understanding of history and whatnot like if like i said that there there were certain things to critique about him but even his his uh, critics that's not what they critiqued him on was his intelligence or his understanding of history that's for damn sure right so, so the next person that we could bring up is daniel dennett and Actually, so I should, I should probably first say the term new atheist is not a term that any of these four gentlemen actually like um, <laughs> that they uh, use <laughs> that they use themselves. Right. And that's true. It's interesting that whenever you get like a title that's capitalized, capital N, capital A, new atheist, that like it just it sort of becomes larger than they are. And sure. Well, well think because it, does it gives matter. a brand and it gives something for people to latch on to as sure, a, sure. as, you know, something new that's hip. And, oh, these guys are attacking religion. This is awesome. Yeah, and like all their books did, like they came out relatively in, like in the same time yeah. frame. Like I think right. Sam Harris's book was first. Uh, his book called The End of Faith came out in two thousand and four, mm-hmm. and then Dawkins came out in oh six. Dennett came out in oh six, and Hitchens came out in oh seven. But yeah. it's like they've spoke together a few times. They had that um, the the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse talk on you know that mm-hmm. that you can watch on YouTube, and they did do a lot of stuff together for a few yeah. years, but. Uh, Religion is not the extent of what they they really focused on, which actually brings us to Daniel Dennett, who is a like legitimate philosopher of the mind. Yeah, and uh, he wrote one book about religion specifically, and it was called "Breaking the Spell: Religion as a Natural Phenomenon" in two thousand and six. And yeah, his big claim is just evolution can actu- actually explain religion as a natural phenomenon, and mm-hmm. um. But I think the the point here about Dennett is, I sort of been thinking of like, um, uh, like, I uh, hate the player, or excuse me, don't hate the player, hate the game, yeah. because it's like, uh, Dennett would love to talk about on national TV about the philosophy of the mind and moral yes. ethics and complex computer systems right, and, and free will and, and, and free will. determinism like, and all that fun stuff. He would yeah. love to talk about it to a general right. audience, but the I stuff agree. that gets focused on the most is religion, and it's not. Like yep. his fault. Uh, it's no, not I any totally of their agree. fault. Yeah, I totally um, agree. I, I think some fault can definitely be blamed because of kind of how brash. I think they were, like the way that they were attacking was. I don't want to say new, but it was new in the sense of how hard they were going. But I, I totally take your point that all, all of them really the only the only uh, books that they wrote on religion were those uh, four. And I, I think Daniel Dennett actually he's of the authors or of all four of these as authors. I think I like Dennett more actually than all of them. And it, yeah. to me, it's because just I love philosophy, uh, the philosophy of mind. It's, I'm studying psychology, which obviously has everything to do with the mind. And yeah. he, uh, his book, Consciousness it, um, Explained, which is something I'm going right. to recommend, that book just ch- changed everything for me. Even if it may not be accurate, nobody really knows what consciousness is. But the way his, um, his just uh, thought experiments 
and the stories and just the little like quirks that he comes up with are incredible and he just changes your entire thinking about consciousness and the mind and evolution and how we got to where we are and he's like I said I think he's a lot more uh, sophisticated in his writing because he's the philosopher and he really only wrote one book on religion and it's about religion as natural phenomena he didn't really he kind of criticized it but i mean not really it's it's really he's a really light spoken guy actually especially even right. in his writings and he even talks about like he literally has black tie christmas events at his house like yeah. he loves christmas carols mm-hmm. and he like, sings it, them himself he's yeah says, he right? sings yeah. them himself yeah. uh he he's like culturally christian in that sense and like right. some of that more so like some of that more nuance actually for all four of these thinkers some of that nuance isn't mentioned enough like even in their That's four true. horsemen uh discussion um they all talked about how they love um religious spiritual music and yeah they all mentioned that they put up christmas trees and it's mm-hmm. not like their uh their lives aren't completely all about you know they're not See, i think a lot of them know. are labeled as anti-theist as opposed to a theist so oh, hitchens for sure hitchens loves like to call himself talk. an anti-theist right there's no is, yeah <laughs> it's just a, it's a simple idea of is not only do uh, does he not believe in god he would hate there to be a god and he calls like the idea of heaven is like a celestial, celestial. dictatorship and if I, I remember he actually he, he even called it a celestial north korean dictatorship right, at one which point is, <laughs> which is the perfect little extra detail there yeah <laughs> i know it just really puts it into perspective how he really thought <laughs> so the final new atheist uh is sam harris and so Kaufman, in his National Review piece, he quotes somebody named David Bentley Hart, and he says, Sam Harris declares all dogma pernicious except his own thoroughly dogmatic attachment to non-dualistic contemplative mysticism of a sort which he mistakenly imagines he has discovered in one school of Tibetan Buddhism and which, naturally, he characterizes as purely rational and scientific. Okay, I think what that's is, funny. I think what it's a funny. sentence. It is funny. It <laughs> is, because that was the first time. I've, n- I've never really seen anyone critique him about his – his trips to or over to uh to those uh what are they called meditation retreats sorry couldn't right. the word yeah so, that's the first time i heard anyone call him out no i did laugh when i read that i was like funny this is kind of bullshit but it's really funny how he how he wrote it or how he did it <laughs> no it's funny and i think harris out of all four of these people actually though he is he has focused on religion the most yeah uh so he has a book called the end of faith which came out in 2004 and it's about basically uh it's it, it's it mostly covers um the three monotheistic religions and even in the last chapter he briefly he mentions um a meditation and buddhism yeah, and consciousness it's all about, and belief and all that kind of stuff but it's only it's only in the last chapter though i think right and then his second book is called letter to a christian nation and so it's it's all about how uh, how irrational christian um christianity is and how it's actually bad for um moral and scientific and political progress and then he did put out a book with Majid Nawaz, who's a um, Muslim reformer um, in the UK right now, called Islam and the Future of Tolerance. Um, but I should say, right, it's interesting that he goes on Bill Maher when his book about spirituality without religion came out, Waking Up, in 2004. <laughs> and he had no time to discuss it because Ben Affleck called Harris and Maher racist, bigoted, people islamophobes yeah islamophobes yeah and it, no it was gross and racist that's what it was that's right that's the exact quote it's just yeah. gross and racist it's yes. like it's like saying the shifty jew and it, yeah, it's really, yeah. <laughs> yeah the shifty jew that's what it was yeah. yep and it was like where did that come from oh my but, gosh uh, yeah, harris agree. definitely does criticize religion probably the strongest right now well, again uh hitchens has passed away dennett is a philosopher of the mind and dawkins mm-hmm. has a new book out and it's all about it's all like it's, it's a collection of essays about science again about science and evolution so, yeah yeah harris mm-hmm. does focus on religion the most but he right. does also have a podcast that has 200 that just, episodes almost right. that and there's all over almost the place. all about different for everything yeah, from, yeah. from consciousness artificial intelligence all that fun stuff yeah I, so, I wanted to say real quick just that harris is definitely the most influential person when it comes to um ideas and whatnot for me i guess i have to say he really flipped my world around 
because I had kind of questioned religion a few years ago, but I never, I never heard any actual arguments against religion. And then I, someone told me, "Hey, you need to check out Sam Harris." Kind of when I started to question things, and he just literally had existence come crashing down upon me and made me question everything that I thought. And while I don't, of course, I don't agree with every little thing he says, he is no doubt a really inspirational person for me. Right, right. I agree. Um, I really like Sam Harris. I've read all of his work um mm -hmm. i listened to his podcast religiously i shouldn't yep. say religiously that's funny <laughs> no, that, that, that's <laughs> regularly the, that is the perfect adjective for it that actually. actually is pretty funny uh and uh he to me and i feel like a lot of people might roll like roll their eyes about it if they know who sam harris is but i do feel like he's a dangerous thinker but his temperament is pretty conservative so he doesn't seem bombastic but right. he's definitely not on board with much of what um, conservatism and Republican capital R, capital R Republicanism right. is about, um, and that that actually can bring us to our second piece, which was in Salon dot com. Mm -hmm. So National Review is a conservative publication. Salon dot com is a is a left publication. Right. So. Well, I just want to say real quick yeah. about the National Review um, yeah. article that I am a National Review reader, and this this was one of the first articles that I was almost had my my palm in my face the whole time. That right. was article. I encourage you all to read it. You should, even if yes. you don't know who these guys are, you should still just read this to see. But definitely read some of the rebuttals and actually check these guys out because this to me that this was a terrible piece. And I also wanted to make note one of the senior editors, a Charles C. W. Cook, who I he's actually one of my uh, of the people at National Review, he's definitely one of my favorite. He's not religious at all, and I so I wish uh, someone could kind of question him about this, or I want to know what he has to say because he is, you know, very conservative politically, but he is he's not a religious person, and I think that's just interesting. Him being one of the senior editors at National Review, I just I would I, I'd be curious to know what what he thinks about this. I guess right, I agree, and uh, yeah, you sh um, people should be a nonpartisan reader. Um, you should read far and wide, and mm -hmm. it makes you a better thinker. It makes you uh, a more sympathetic person. And, yeah, totally you should agree. do it. It's important. Um, I agree. I'm, I'm, I think my favorite writer from National Review is um, David French, who is, like, a former Iraq veteran. Yeah. Um, I tend to just agree with him more or less more than anyone else on that website. Oh, okay. Um, so Salon.com published a piece by Phil Torres, who I've never heard of um, until reading this piece. Um, he either. apparently <laughs> is a... He has a degree in biology, and I think he's a Ph.D. student in biology, too. Um, oh, okay. And, uh, but the, the article is titled, From the Enlightenment to the New Dark Ages, How New Atheism Slid into the Alt-Right. So, so now we, So now we can kind of get into sort of why maybe the left has... Um, um, yeah, like, like why the left decided that they wanted to leave them. Because I think, I don't know if we explicitly said it, but kind of the reason the right pe or people on the right hate them is because they criticize religion so strongly. And obviously, uh, most people who are on the right tend to be uh, religious in some form or another. Right. I think I think that's changing with the new younger demographics, but especially in the older generation, if it's almost a guarantee, if you're conservative, you're Christian in America. I'm I'm speaking of America, not in the world generally, but I mean maybe in the world generally actually, but I know for um, sure in America. No, I, I have I actually read the other day that it's like eighty percent of Republican voters have some sort of religious affiliation, and it's like forty seven percent of Democrats. So oh, wow. that, that's, that's big a big difference. Yeah, that's a big difference um, for sure. So. I think my response about the left here is, uh, if you mean anyone who's who would ever vote for a Democrat or consider themselves liberal, um, I would say they probably would still support someone like Harris, um, who's a liberal. Um, the far left, the anti-imperialist left, probably don't support Harris that much, but they never really cared about him in the first place. And I say him here because really he's the only new atheist who's active, and That's he's true. who. He's who this Torres guy in Salon focused on the most. Um, well, it seems the other two are active, but they're active in their academic careers as real jobs, not as being public figures that, uh, you know, that criticize religion and, you know, on the public forum. But right. I think uh, which I want to I want to ask you your thoughts on this. But so I think the one the one question that he poses to Harris that I thought is a good question, at least because I think about it a lot, is mm -hmm. in what in what situation would claiming that the West is engaged in a civilization clash with an entire religion actually improve the expected outcome? 
Right. I think that's a good question too. Of of that entire piece, that 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 was definitely one of the one of the points that actually made sense. I can just say it, a lot of that piece I didn't really, but that one did make made me think a little bit because I actually just had a recent um, interview with someone who is the executive director of the Muslim Association of Puget Sounds. American Muslim Empowerment Network. I hope I nice. got that. Hope I got right. that all right. It's Hold a on, mouthful. But, right. She was she was great. We had a great conversation, and and one of the one of the things that I noticed was that she was doing some of the kind of sleight of hand, dodging mm. my hard questions that I know that um you know that that people do when they're debating people like Sam Harris or so, and. What I realized is part of me wanted to just kind of engage with her because I, I know, first of all, I noticed that it was happening. But the second part of me thought, isn't her message way more important? Isn't that if she can take the Quran and interpret it in a much more peaceful way and, and whatnot, isn't that a lot more important? Shouldn't we actually try to um, try and push her message as opposed to just taking? So like, uh, for instance, Sam Harris did a podcast called I What ISIS R Really Wants. And ISIS basically just l lays out almost everything Sam Harris ha has been saying. And I brought that up to her. And she's like, yeah, but they're they're just a cult. The vast majority of, P of Muslims don't believe in that. And we shouldn't take th them seriously because no one takes the Westboro Baptist seriously. And it's, it's true, but at, at the same time, you can't deny, as uh, Harris points out, the Amish are not blowing anyone up. The Scientologists are not blowing up. The, the, the Mormons, you can criticize them all you want, and they take out an ad in the newspaper saying, hey, you want to check it out? Whereas you, you go, uh, Charlie Hebdo posts a cartoon of Muhammad, and then people get killed. So I guess that's kind of where I'm kind of torn, I guess, where I think that the kind of the people on the left, the more peaceful Muslims, I think that is a much more important message that needs to be said. But at the same time, I don't like denying the truth, I guess. I, right. I, I, I don't ignore the fact that we do have a problem with Islam compared to the other religions, if you wanted to say that, right. that, that there's I just don't think we can deny that there we have a specific problem with a group with groups of people that come from a specific um, ideology. So that's so, where I land. So I was actually thinking about like a strong argument for why people push back on Sam Harris. And it's because of my field, actually, political science and uh What's but what's funny is I was uh, going back over the end of faith this morning, and so Sam Harris himself, he writes, this book ignores most of what commentators on the Middle East have said about the roots of Muslim violence. It ignores the painful history of all of the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. It ignores the collusion of Western powers with corrupt dictatorships. It ignores the endemic poverty and lack of economic opportunity that now plague the Arab world. So, wow. Uh, the pushback is always why like why do you ignore right. what you just wrote in your own book um, and I think that's the strongest argument against Sam Harris is he doesn't uh, engage in actual actual ma like material reality on the ground right. as much as he probably should mm -hmm. um, I think he does a decent job of fielding questions about it but he definitely does focus on uh, how, like how on power, the ideas he cares more how about Islam beliefs, as a set of ideas as they are right on how powerful beliefs uh, are and I think I always think like a little bit I feel like political scientists probably should focus more on beliefs and I think Sam Harris should also focus more on 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 geopolitics you know okay um, yeah yeah that's fair if I remember like one of his main kind of comebacks is that there's tons of groups um, that have been occupied by the Chinese or somewhere I forget over in, in the Middle East and they haven't ever broken out into any type of violence even though they've they've kind of went under similar chaoses but I don't think it's really comparable because I think with the Middle East uh, one thing is oil which I think we could get into a whole rabbit hole on on that but just the fact that they're kind of sitting on so many resources having to do with oil I think that Yes, Sam does ignore those uh, geopolitical things. I think probably, yeah, actually to his own, to a little bit of, of his detriment, I guess I have to say. But it's I don't know, it's just it's just hard because when what he uh, when you read what groups like ISIS put out, they specifically say, hey, even if you stop all this geopolitics, we still hate you. Right. Now now ISIS doesn't speak for every extremist terrorist group, but yet they're pretty they're the most prominent one at least in in uh, right now. And so what I think is that. 
uh, when when you read something like that, when ISIS just says, "Hey, you can stop killing us, you can stop enslaving us," like you know, like they say, you you can stop doing all these things, and we will still hate you because you are infidels. And that's something that geopolitics can't solve, I don't think. Right. Um, so let's 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 broaden the conversation back out again. And so, why does the like why is the left scared of critiquing Islam? And I'm someone who's on the left, so I should say that. Um, it depends who you mean by the left. Uh, there actually are a lot of, of of thinkers on the left who write in smaller publications that I read that the general public might not know about, like Descent Magazine. Um, Michael Kazin is a editor there, and he's also a historian at NYU, I believe. Oh, okay. And he has a piece called Isla- like Islamism and the Left, and it's a really, really strong defense of why the left should critique Islam. And... So he says ultimately that uh, people on the left are engaged in an anti-imperial, anti-racism politics, and like what that what that can produce is is like is the idea that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and um, especially in younger in younger people who aren't schooled in or, I mean I would say most people aren't schooled in Middle East politics and they right. don't know about female genital mutilation. They don't know a lot about how uh, countries around, like uh, Muslim countries around the world and how difficult it is for women to exist. Um, and it sounds kind of d- dumb to say that, but I, I genuinely think it, it's true that they don't, like the Muslims that Americans see are American Muslims, which are, uh, you know, are awesome. <laughs> and right. they're, they're integrated into our society as they should be. Well, um, it's like the vast majority of American Muslims are engineers and doctors and just professionals of all kind. And, and actually, like a lot of them uh, lean liberal on social uh, policies as, as far right. as uh, uh, now American Muslims. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and Kazin says that the values of the left are Western values. Take only the left if the left takes them seriously. And I think that is what, why, I, why, I, why I'm on the left is I, that's what I believe in. So the idea of like democracy, gender equality, individual liberty, pluralism, and anti-hierarchy, uh, those are Western values that the left is supposed to take seriously, and our critique of the right is that the right are hypocrites about it all. Um, but a lot of the left right now is sort of trying to throw away the entire Western canon right. uh, for no reason. Which is like a lot of my critique as someone from the right is that what I see is uh, I wouldn't say the majority of the left, but a, a vocal, at least a, a more vocal minority of the left is just willing to throw away those values because now the question is why you had brought up kind of why are they afraid? And I wonder, is it because there are real consequences for criticizing Islam? Because when people like the the ex-Muslims of North America, they have serious security concerns where they have to go through all these different protocols. And that's because what they're saying has real world consequences where as when Harris and all of them are criticizing Christians, they don't really care because the only crazy Christians are the Westboro Baptists and they're not killing anybody. The most crazy ones you find are the ones blowing up abortion doctors which happens once every you know 10 years it, right it, it isn't even actually relevant so I, I think or do you think it has to do with maybe they're actually are scared of real world consequences or do you think they just don't want to offend anybody and it plays into the identity politics that they can have the you know the intersectionality type they're a victim we're a victim type you know type mentality so I don't michael know, what so michael kazan quotes this guy named pascal uh, bruckner who he argues that the term islamophobia was a clever invention because it amounts to making Islam a subject that one cannot touch without being accused of racism. And again, the left is, one of the big pillars of the left is anti-racism. And just that, just that, that epithet thrown at you, you are Islamophobic. Like just that, that word is in existence. It it makes it really difficult to question ideas. I agree. I mean, I'm not going to slide past your point, the idea of maybe they actually are scared of critiquing Islam because of sort of 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 what we just said about Islam, how it is the only religion right now who threatens to kill you if you draw their profit or even just say the words I just said, you know. Right. Uh, And like I I, this this might sound condescending, but I think that's taking them too seriously. (laughs) I think I don't think it's fear of that. I think it's part of. It's part of the idea that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And a lot of the left is built on anti-Americanism, too. Um, and again, so any anything that is anti-American 
anti-imperialism as they as they see it is sort of on their side even though there's nothing liberal about isis hamas hezbollah Um, so is there any of that that you do agree with though as someone on the left is there any of those points that you find any merit with so i think that i think that hang on i want to say more so on the anti-american i guess what I don't want to say what anti-American tendencies you have. I just, I'm just wondering, like, right. what, what of those merit, do you find merit in any of those arguments? You mean I don't know exactly, don't know, don't know exactly what you're asking me, but I'll, I'll say something here. Uh, sure. So, I think, I think it's true that we shouldn't. That, so I'll just say this. So I actually think America should take in uh, all of the refugees from Syria. No, I just made a bold claim there, right? I know we're not gonna. I know. I know we're not gonna take in literally every single one, but I think we should take in as many Syrian refugees as possible. And I'm not scared that they're going to commit terrorist attacks. Um, right. I think America is. I'm actually making a pro-America argument. I think we incorporate um, races and ethnicities and cultures better than anyone in the world, and we are a melting pot. And uh, it, it has been relatively successful. We are a country of 300 million people trying to engage in the most interesting uh, democratic project of all time. Right. Um, it's messy, complicated, but I think what we should do is take in as many refugees as possible. Um, I Again, like I listen to, I, I'm, I'm actually well-read in, in the Middle East. I'm well-read about terrorism. Um, I know who all the various groups are around the world committing acts of terrorism. I do think it has to be, we have to, uh, so here's where the left is right, or at least uh, the left, yeah, is, is getting towards the truth. Um, the Arab world, especially the Middle East, um, they have not had control of their own lives um, since, well, even 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 during the Ottoman Empire, it wasn't exactly democratic, you know? Um, but as soon as the fall of the Ottoman Empire occurred, they, their countries were literally occupied by Western powers, France. Um, I don't know if we want to tell all the listeners, but if you're not aware, that happened in the 20s, if you guys are right. aware. Right, right, yes, exactly. And then so uh, the Arab world was divided by France and Great Britain, and then uh, France and Great Britain, especially Great Britain, supported dictators, often dictators who had the minority religion in these countries um, because that would sort of give... It gives it's it's very cynical, but it gives it it it's a reason why the minority government will side with the Western power because if not, then they're they're gonna face a democratic backlash. So we did support dictatorships uh, for decades. I, I said we here, but I mean like Western countries, right? <laughs> right. Um, in general, uh, supported. Um, strong you and me, men. Patrick. Actually, no. You right. and me you and personally I propped up Saddam Hussein. Yeah, we are very powerful. Um, <laughs> and I do think, like, this is also part of it's still post-colonialism, literally going on in in many of these countries. We have people battling for the first time to ever have control of their of their countries, and it's going to be messy. And if anyone sort of like <laughs> the American South, like we're a bunch of terrorists. Like, if anyone. If anyone messed, uh, you know, m- got involved in our politics 200 years ago, who knows what our country would look like now? Um, so now I'm kind of just babbling. But you ask me, what do I support? Like, what are some right. of the stronger left, ar- like left arguments um, against sort of, I guess, the new atheists? Right. I was say, if we could tie this back into the new atheist uh, conversation, what of the more, I guess, since a lot of people make the distinction between progressive and regressive, what would you say of the what a lot of people call a regressive? What of those ideas? What of that criticism of the new atheism do you agree with as someone who's on the left? I mean, what, I don't agree with any of I don't agree with Islamophobia like that term is bullshit. Um, I think there's. There's bigotry towards Muslims, as we just saw a, an explosive device thrown into that mosque in Minnesota, I think yeah. it was, a few days ago, which doesn't get yeah. talked about. Like, right. I would sort of make some, some, some similar-minded arguments about how when, when, when white Americans commit acts of mass killings, how we don't cover that the same way and all that. But right. I wouldn't couch it in any of my, left, my, my left-leaning politics. Um, oh, okay. So I don't really agree with any of the... Any of the, uh, any of like the far left criticism of criticizing Islam, I don't agree with any of it. Um, 
and I, I and only because I don't like I I disagree with sort of Richard Spencer, you know, the fucking uh, uh, <laughs> like yeah. neo Nazi on the right. But right. Um, of course I do. Um, I, yeah. and I, I, it's like I, I disagree, disagree with him, but do I think someone should go up and punch him in the face just because he's speaking? No. I mean, look, if we have a movement of Nazis in our country, that we is, are, yeah. we are past the point of like punching them. I don't know what, like, I know that's a different conversation, but. Oh, no, for sure. <laughs> I just kind of wanted to, I guess, to shift a little bit more broadly to the skeptic community in general. One of the criticisms that I really hate is the, the groupthink mentality that seems to happen. So I guess I didn't see this any type of criticism, but I know I've heard people say, oh, you know, Sam Harris and his cult. They don't really say that with uh, the other with uh, the other three because the other three don't have a following like Sam does. But I right. I, I noticed that uh, one thing that I really don't like is just that groupthink mentality, that cult mentality. When a whole bunch of people get together and create their own echo chambers, I think that's a problem. Whether that's on the left, whether that's on the right, whether that's for Sam Harris, whether that's for whoever is uh, who, any of his detractors are, Reza Aslam, Green, Glenn Greenwald, whoever. And I just think. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is I noticed that a lot of people in the skeptic community per se are starting to have that group think mentality. And to me, this is crazy because this and their whole idea is to be skeptics, to question the status quo and to do all and to have that um, individual ideas and to think for yourself. And I, I noticed a lot of people seem to start to to be doing that, creating their own little groups just to counter the other groups. And I just I, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that about the like the capital s skepticism community yeah um, um i have one more point about the end of faith which is sam harris's book so mm -hmm. uh he, probably the most controversial thing that he's ever written is in that book and the likes the of new, reza aslan mm -hmm. who he's that he's a professor of religion and he does a bunch of uh, oh, is that what he is he, he's a professor he, professor he, of religion he, he, he teaches about religion. I'm not saying he actually is qualified to. I'm I thought he has like he has 10 a, degrees. I thought he had 10 he, degree, or anyway, 10 degrees. I'm not saying he actually has a PhD in, in, in theology, but he acts like he does. Right. But, no um, doubt. but guys like Reza Aslan and Jank Uger of the progressive network, the young Turks, um, they like to quote mine him. And they like to say that Sam Harris calls for a nuclear first strike on the Arab world. Right, and I want to read this. That has to be one of the I most wanna, controversial moments for Sam Harris. I think. I'm going to read this package, this passage here, because mm -hmm. I think it actually is, is it is difficult to, uh, to, um, to, to tackle. It's it, it's it's challenging. So, he says, "What will we do if an Islamist regime, which grows dewy-eyed at the mere mention of paradise, ever acquires long-range nuclear weaponry? If history is any guide." We will not be sure about where the offending warheads are or what their state of readiness is, and so we will be unable to rely on targeted conventional weapons to destroy them. In such a situation, the only thing likely to ensure our survival may be a nuclear first strike of our own. Needless to say, this would be an unthinkable crime, as it would kill tens of millions of innocent civilians in a single day, but it may be the only course of action available to us, given what Islamists believe. Um, so Harris's defense in general is always, you have to read that paragraph in the context of the entire book. And I think that's always true about books, Pretty about much passages, everything, from, right. pa passages from books. Yeah. Um, but, uh, that is the, the root of the most sort of, um, um, hate thrown towards Harris is that they think that paragraph is, is him literally saying we should do a nuclear first that strike. Should, right. And it's so, I mean, he kind of does if if an Islamist regime would acquire a nuclear weapon, right? Which th there's only one right now called Iran, mm -hmm. who's even who who's the, who the whole world is worried about getting. And uh, the notion of bombing Iran, even if they acquire nuclear weapons, is so so wrong. That's so crazy um, at this point. It's so wrong. Uh, it, it, that's just not correct. It's not the. Uh, it, it is unthinkable, and mm -hmm. it would kill tens of millions of innocent civilians. Um, and it's not the only course of action available to us. And I think he deserves criticism for that. And I actually never usually, I don't usually think that way about it, but when I read it today again, I was like, um, um, it's, it's very, it's very just, uh, it's, it's so sure of itself. It's too sure of itself. 
Well, so it's I guess if, when I take that, I would want to make the distinction between Iran and then a group like ISIS who is actually suicidal and actually wants to bring about the destruction of the world. I don't think Iran wants to bring about the destruction of the world. I think actually I know on kind of the previous podcast when we talked about North Korea, how I don't think he's a rational um, actor or I'm not as convinced as you are that he's a rational yeah. actor. I do think Iran is. And so yeah. even though they are they um, are more Islamist since the revolution, I think that they for one they have a very young population and yeah. that that young population is leaning towards the left and they care a lot more about cultural ideas yes. than they do about religious ideas so i guess i would make the distinction between worrying about iran and then worrying about if isis which isis is actually being you know kind of crumbling as we speak right now them actually getting a nuclear bomb i think i think they're kind of two different stories so the reason so he says he says Islamist regime, and I think of regime as a as a government. That's why I, that's why I'm saying right. Yeah, that's fair. It's, it only means a government that would right. have a nuclear weapon. Um, but but I mean, what does that matter if 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 ISIS has a nuke in the cave? What does that matter if there's documents on it or, or government documents? If the UN cares about them, I mean, what what difference does that make? Well, it matters because ISIS ISIS could acquire nuclear fuel and they could make a dirty bomb possibly yeah. which is which is a, a serious like concern but they're not going to set up a, a a missile and fire it anywhere like so i'm saying even if they would acquire a nuclear weapon somehow uh the solutions... i'm pretty sure i'm convinced we could take them out and take out their nuclear facilities before they would even launch anything that's my I own mean, personal belief yeah but, but you even said but like you just said facility there, and I'm saying they don't have. They're not going to have access to any okay. facility. They might have some 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 fuel, you know, S that they could use into a dirty bomb. Shit, right. uh, so I'm saying I have to I have to say that he's referring to a nation state. He's referring to a government that would acquire nuclear weaponry, and. Uh, Which, of course, though, but he talks about, you know, in the lieu of really caring about paradise and bringing about the destruction of the world, though. I think that is a, right. you, so you know, that's would, a big yeah, part of the context. So he would say in his hypothetical that he likes to do is that is that so assume that this Islamist regime has acquired nuclear weapons. And I guess we somehow know that they want to they want to use it because of their dewy eyed uh, affinity yeah. for paradise. There's right. just so much that would have to like. Uh, of course, like, and it, it's it's like literally true that there would be a theoretical situation, or I'm sorry, that there'd be a, hi a hypothetical s um, situation where you would want to use a nuclear weapon first. Yeah, like that's not it, that's sh that should not be controversial. Right. But I'm saying it's never it's it's not uh it's not likely to happen. It's not yeah, likely to be necessary. I was gonna say I totally agree with that. That I don't think that. I remember when I first read that a few years ago, I thought I was like, oh, wow. At first, it made me think kind of what would happen if um, ISIS actually had nukes. But the more I think about it, no, I'd have to agree with you there. That It just seems so unlikely that we really don't even need to think about having a nuclear first strike. Maybe that was kind of asking so, for some publicity or. I, I've thought of an answer of where I agree with the left about the new atheist. And okay. I hate that term and I keep using it, but it is about <laughs> the new atheist. <laughs> right. So. That's what the, this conversation's the, about, right? It's right. Like new atheists. The, the critique is that the new atheists have a neoconservative foreign policy. And I... But wouldn't you say that's only maybe Harris and, and Hitchens? I mean, does Richard Dawkins and Dennett really have a neoconservative platform? I don't think so. I, I know literally nothing about Daniel Dennett's foreign policy it's, views. Exactly. And that's kind of my so point. I believe Dawkins was staunchly against the Iraq war. I think so, so yes, too. So, yes, we are talking about Harris and Hitchens. And right. Hitchens, that is where Hitchens sort of um, got a lot of heat from the left is whenever he supported Yeah, it, the well, Iraq he had a debate war. with, wasn't it John Stewart, that he had the debate about the war yeah, with that's that a, everybody right. talked about? Yeah, and, and you, to understand Hitchens' support for the Iraq war, you have to understand his love for the, um, for the Kurds. Um, he always That's wore true. a lapel pin of the Kur of, of the Kurdish flag on his on his jacket, mm -hmm. and uh, he also his love for the Kurds and his absolute animosity towards Saddam Hussein Saddam, right. was was one of the worst people ever you know ever around. And his sons too. He used to critique the hell out of his sons. <laughs> right, and uh, like there was a chemical weapon attack actually in 1988 against um, against the Kurdish people, and it's actually considered like the largest. It's it's the 
It's the largest chemical weapons attack directed against a civilian populated area in history. Okay. And that was during the Iran-Iraq war. And I'm saying, like, Hitchens was so well-educated on the Middle East that he truly would have supported, he did, like, anything that takes that took out Saddam Hussein, because right. Saddam Hussein was a madman who was literally a genocidal maniac. Right. Um, and, but I, I, I think he was wrong. And that is very difficult um, to tackle because I'm, I'm, I'm humble enough to know that Hitchens was really, really smart. He was really, well, he was really um, well read, but he, I think he was wrong about the Iraq War. Yeah, it's hard for me because I think, I, I think one, I was uh, eight years old when 9/11 right. happened. So to say that I had any type of adequate understanding of foreign policy when it happened would be completely ridiculous. But in hindsight, I definitely would agree that I, I, I think uh, the Iraq War is, uh, was wrong. I think most people on the right and left kind of agree it seems for the the most part at least the the sensible people who i would call kind of the people on the right that i I more agree with i think kind of we agree in hindsight that it was wrong but hindsight's 2020 i mean how right it's like given all of his knowledge at the time did he know it was going to turn out to be a disaster the way he did i mean he couldn't have predicted that but i i i just i agree with you though i do think it was wrong but at the time i just want to again at the time i was eight i didn't know anything right but i was just yeah. trying to think of a of a possible argument that i agree with the left about regarding yeah. their their foreign policy and i do think it's it can right. be kind of considered neoconservative especially because the the that term specifically refers to the acceptance and the approval of like unilateral action. And Hitchens has said, hey, yeah, if that's the, true. If, he, he did say if the UN doesn't ag- agree with us, like so be it. So he that's 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 neoconservative. Yeah, and, that's uh, a good point. I that's mean, a good point. Harris kind of lost me uh, a couple. Probably it was last year, right? Whenever he said that, which you might disagree with this, but that electing someone like Ben Carson is better than Noam Chomsky. Right. Because so let me let, I'll give my defense. OK, so my defense is this. Ben Carson mm-hmm. is an idiot. Ben Carson is like a complete moron who doesn't know anything about anything. Um, OK, he's a good well, surgeon. Besides brain surgery. Right. He's a good brain surgeon. That does not mean he knows anything about uh, politics. And Chomsky, um, first of all, I, like just like the, the political science uh, scientist in me is that Chomsky would have to be pulled to the center because of our system we have. And uh, there's no way that Chomsky would be able to implement like a a worker utopia. <laughs> and uh, he also has said that he would take that he supports bombing ISIS, and like that was never acknowledged. Um, by I didn't Sam know Harris. that. No, yeah, he, I didn't know that. And at all. he said the words like he goes, "No, I think we should actually like bomb ISIS." And he knows right. that there's going to be civilians killed too. Like Chomsky right. knows. Right. Um, and like that's where Harris is a little bit too overzealous or if you want to just not interpret it and just and take him at his word he's definitely now could be more considered center right then if he's right. going to say that someone like i mean again he, he wouldn't say that but if he's going to say things like someone like ben carson is better than chomsky i think he's 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 losing the story a little bit but he would say everyone else is because that's sure. his number one focus is right now is about islam specific threat to the world yeah, no, I have a few thoughts on that actually. Okay, I know one of my uh, one of my most controversial posts ever on uh, it was either Facebook or Instagram, I forget, was criticizing Ben Carson, basically saying that he is a religious lunatic and that he has no place being anywhere near the the helms of government. But look who our president is now. So <laughs> kind of looking back, thinking about that. But uh, one of my most, I had people that I had grown up with, this one guy literally wanted to fight me because I said, because we were talking about how Carson had said that the pyramids were built so Joseph could store bird seed or some yeah, crazy, it was a, it was a grain nonsense. silo, right? Yeah, something re- completely ridiculous. It's like, no, we know exactly what the pyramids were used for. And I had criticized that and I got so much hate from people mostly religious my like more religious kind of friends and um but we've since reconciled of course and we're fine now but i think that i would i would be okay with carson i guess because i think of the people he he uh he would appoint i guess same, i wouldn't be the, as scared the I don't same think people he's that trump tri- appointed the same I don't people think that so. trump appointed uh yeah like I don't know. I, I, I don't really know as. I guess I don't really know as much about uh, Carson, but I, it's. I don't know. I think that I wouldn't. I guess I wouldn't be scared of him being a president. Now, do I think he's? I'd be horrified. Well, do I think that's he's more, horrifying? 
You think so? I don't know. I guess it, it doesn't I'm scare scared. me as much, but I'm, I'm also not scared of Chomsky for the reasons that you said. I think I think Chomsky is kind I think he's when he makes the arguments that like, you know, America is the number one terrorist nation and he doesn't care about intent, which is, you know, Harris's yeah, main yeah, yeah. critique of Chomsky. Well, that's where I line up. But as far as uh, I just wanted to make this final point of and there's no and to me, there's no intellectual comparison between Ben Carson and Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky had, like basically created the field of linguistics and changed yeah everything of how we understand human language i don't really agree with a lot of his foreign policy but i guess to end i would when it comes to intellect i don't think it's even close but i wouldn't right. be i wouldn't be scared of ben carson i guess so the the point about intent i would say so chomsky's like chomsky's like actually incorrect there but he's kind of correct in the sense of if you, if you go by the numbers, right? No, but no, 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 no I'm sorry. I, 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 I should be more specific. He's not correct that the U.S. is a terrorist state. He's correct that intention doesn't matter if your house got if your house got blown up by a bomb, right? On accident because it was the wrong house. Yeah. Like your intentions do not matter right. at all. So for individuals, he's kind of getting human nature right there. Intention doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, I read that debate between Harris and or that it was actually like an email exchange between mm -hmm. Harris and Chomsky. And I did think Chomsky lost me there on the intention part. Again, like actually he's actually wrong, but he's not completely wrong because people that's yeah, true that's about fair. people. Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you are on the beach and a drone hits your family and the U.S. comes and says, hey, we're sorry. Eh, I mean, no, but there is a point to, to be made. I remember uh, uh, Jocko Willink, I think, brings this up all the time. He's like, look, what the U.S. does compared to other countries, though, the U.S. will go to those families. They will offer them monetary support. They will actually try to fix the wrongs and try to explain, whereas the uh, terrorist groups, for obvious reasons, they don't give a fuck. Right, and it's like they, they were you. Harris and Chomsky were talking past each other. Like Harris was talking about you know yeah like if isis had a nuclear bomb and they could actually drop it on a city and kill as many people as possible they would they would want to do that because of their belief system and if the united states had a bomb on a drone that was super smart and it could it could literally only take out a, a terrorist that it would that, that we would take out a terrorist right. and not want to hit any civilians at all and that that intention matters and i think it's true Sure. But they were I think that was that was more of a also kind of a public relations type thing. Yeah, that's I'm true. Not really gonna, I'm not going to get into that much, but I feel like it was Yeah, I don't even think I actually read the full exchange. I think I more so just like listened to their speaking afterwards. So I think Harris had a podcast kind of my thoughts on Chomsky about it. and that kind of Right. Yeah, I think I actually paid more attention to that than I did the actual exchange, so I can't really comment on the exchange. Right. But so the the the, the final article that we kind of want to talk about is is again it's actually about the skeptic community in general and it's written by a science journalist named john horgan for scientific american and i remember i actually heard him talk about the article on a blogging heads conversation um and i was just like it, it, it kind of represented much of my like my politics um like so the the article is titled dear skeptics bash homeopathy and bigfoot less mammograms and war more and uh it's hard for me to disagree i feel like a lot of the skeptical community are spending a lot of their time debunking conspiracy theorists and i actually think that's more important than people think because conspiracy theory theories are popular um i think the average person probably knows more about them than war even you know yeah uh, so it is important to get people to see uh, their own, like their own logical fallacies, and get them right. to see, like, to learn reason and logic. Yeah. But I, I can't. And the homeopathy, that I think, is also important though, because people actually do hurt themselves by either not treating right. themselves when they need real treatment, or using bullshit remedies that don't make any sense. So, so you know, that actually does hurt people. But go ahead, because I, I agree with but you. On that. <laughs> uh so but 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 he uh john horgan in his article says that uh that tests often do more harm than good for every woman whose life is extended because a mammogram detected a tumor up to 33 receive unnecessary treatment including biopsies surgery radiation and chemotherapy yeah um, that's totally a fair point because that is there's no, no denying that that is one of the problems with American healthcare. I, I know we could probably we've talked about this before, but that that whole uh, when you made the point about how you get one and that just compounds on that that's totally fair. I couldn't find anything at fault with that. 
put that um, on there. And he actually does say, which kind of sounds like Chomsky, right? He says, the United States, yeah. I submit, is the greatest threat to peace since right. 9-11, U.S. wars in Afghanistan, yeah. Iraq, and Pakistan have killed 370,000 people. That includes more than 210,000 civilians, many of them children. These are conservative estimates. Um, but so I feel like he's 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 doing what there's a piece in the Guardian newspaper from a uh, from the UK that was he, he, and they and they called it like um, like throwing the dead cat on the table. It's where you're like like it, the, don't ever throw the dead cat on the table. The sense of like let people care about what they care about and don't play like these oppression Olympics games where oh like like what I'm focused on is 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 what everyone should focus on. Sure. But again, but it's hard to say that it's hard to disagree with the fact with the fact that we really should really care more about eliminating disease and stopping war. But again, it's it's not a it's not a zero sum game going on. Of course, um, yeah. I but agree I think with that. I think it's important argument though for people to to get in their minds about hmm, like it is kind of true that these skeptics don't focus on some of the more important issues. Right. And that's why I, that, that that is why I like the piece, and that and, and that's why I recommended it to you. Yeah, that's actually the main point that I wanted. I know that I wanted to make about the piece in general is that that was hands down one of the most challenging as far as challenging to my personal thoughts and beliefs piece that I've read in quite some time. When I sent you that text, I mean, it, it's true that uh, especially that first half, because I couldn't I pretty much agree with all, with almost everything besides, like I said, you know, I think homeopathy does that actually hurt people sometimes and and you know uh like you mentioned conspiracy theorists do do have some harm but his his main point is true i mean those when it comes to the real scale of what we're dealing with um in the world we definitely shouldn't be concentrating as much brain power on that at least i personally don't think after he brought that up now i almost com completely disagree with the second half especially okay. his sentiments calling the the u.s the greatest threat to peace i, I mean which I have a few reasons, but overall, I just wanted to, to make a point that we were talking about how, or you made the point that we should read other things that especially challenge our beliefs. This right. is one that just hit me straight to the core. And it was, it was awesome, honestly, because I haven't read something and then just thought, well, shit, was I right about what I thought about this? Am I wrong? And I, I just think that's, a, that's important to, to point out. Now, I don't know if you had any other point you wanted to make about just, that war, but I, I had something that I, I wanted to read uh, in response to is, to the, the quote about the greatest threat to peace. Yeah, I was going to ask you real fast. So what do you mean that this piece itself challenged your beliefs? Like, what did you believe coming into it? That basically there wasn't that many problems with the skeptic community and what they right. were doing. Besides my okay. groupthink, I've already kind of had that groupthink mentality, but I didn't know that. I, I guess I never just the thought of criticizing homeopathy and conspiracy theories instead of uh, problems like war and healthcare costs and, and all these things. Whether or not I agree with his sentiment of the war in healthcare, I totally agree that's far more important. And he made a very kind of a, a just a strong punch at the skeptic community that I had never read. I had never really uh, read any criticism of them, and so that hit me because I had kind of assume myself to line up with them more than anyone else i guess if you want to right. talk about groups but because i hate group mentality so much i i just i just can't do that but that's just the main thing is that it really made me just just think kind of okay well how do i view the this community in general how do i view how, how do i view the priority of their problems right okay interesting yeah go ahead and read that that okay. quote you have yeah so this is from harvard psychologist steven pinker he responds uh he was this is an direct response to that uh okay to i think it was the last two paragraphs of that article or the last paragraph just kind of where he talks about the war and so steven pinker writes in speaking of false uh i'm sorry in speaking of false dichotomies the question of whether we should blame muslim fanaticism or the united states as the greatest threat to peace is hardly a sophisticated way for skeptical scientists to analyze war as horgan distorts them to do certainly the reckless american invasions of afghanistan and iraq led to incompetent governments failed states or outright anarchy that allowed sunni versus shiite and other internecine violence to explode but this is true only because these regions harbored fanatical hatreds which nothing short of a brutal uh, brutal dictatorship could repress according to the upsala con sorry upsala I, I could be pronouncing that incorrect conflict data project which i will link to in the show notes out of the 11 ongoing wars in 2008 only or eight of them which is 73 percent involved radical muslim forces as one project one of the 11 and sorry one out of the 11 wars involved involved radical muslim forces as one of the combatants and another two involved putin backed militias against ukraine 
and then the other one was a tribal war in the South Sudan. So to blame all these wars together with ISIS atrocities on the United States may be cathartic to those with certain political sensibilities, but it's hardly the way for scientists to understand the complex causes of war and peace in the world today. So what do you think about that? Hmm. Well, I do think uh, John Horgan here wasn't too specific, and he was he was he made broad generalizations. Um, and I do think we need the more we, we need a more sophisticated understanding of the multiple causes of war, which I said is also though a criticism of right sort of, of, the, of the same uh, yeah. of the skeptics and the new atheist mm -hmm. community, right? Yeah. Um, I kind of again I think they're kind of both talking past one another. Um, but Hor but but Horgan here says um, that the anti-war movement is terribly weak, and I do think we underestimate. Um, well, so actually, there was a very very large protest um, around the world before the Iraq War started that didn't get a lot of coverage, and it just didn't matter. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I do think we need to have more of an anti-war movement. Um, in general, um, I don't know if the skeptics are not to blame for that, though. Like, it's You're not right. the skeptics. It's, <laughs> it's not, not the skeptics' their fault. fault. <laughs> sure. Um, and they totally would. Um, I mean, I guess I'm making a generalization now too, but it's it's not like they're. It's not like the skeptic magazine is uh, is out there like promoting war. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I just, I mean, we all need a more sophisticated view of everything. <laughs> so I guess as far as that criticism goes, it is kind of hard to, but w when you're writing in Scientific American, you're going to get criticisms from people like this. So basically, but, the, um, Horgan is saying that the skeptic community should should challenge, um, the should tackle the hardest target of all, which is war. Yeah, that's to, actually one of the points. He says soft targets and hard targets, right? And like the soft right. targets are the conspiracy theorists, and it's true; those are easy. Those are easy to debunk and easy, easy to call out and ridiculous. Whereas, you got to be a bit more sophisticated to understand healthcare costs and war. <laughs> right. So, so you want to move on to our back pages? Yeah, sure. Um, my first one I want to recommend uh, for everyone, because what we're going to do is, since we're talking about the new atheists, we're going to recommend a work from them. It's to be a book, essay. I don't know. I, I'm not aware of what you picked, but right. I'll, I'll just go ahead and lay out mine real quick. For Richard Dawkins, I'm recommending The Greatest Show on Earth, and that is because that's it's the only one I was able to get through, which I don't know how much yeah. of a, I don't know how, if that if that really sells it as much of a recommendation. But it, it was really good because it's just the evidence for evolution. And so it's if you really want to understand evolution and how it works. And he does have, you know, cool thought experiments and great ways to explain it. But so for Christopher Hitchens, I want to recommend his book, The Missionary Position. This is a book on his critique of Mother Teresa. And it is harsh. It is brutal. It's provocative. And it is just you just read it. It's short. It only took me like maybe two hours to read or something like that. I think it's only like a hundred something yeah, pages in a little book. Right. Yeah, it's great. And so for for uh, for Professor Daniel Dennett, I want to recommend Consciousness Explained, which I think I had mentioned when we were talking about him. This book yeah. is awesome. It made it it started my interest in the theory of mind and kind of where my academic interests are leaning towards now, which is understanding how technology is affecting psychology in our minds. And this book just really started my, uh, started the process of trying to understand consciousness and learning that we don't understand consciousness at all. And it's funny because I wanted to point out the book's called Consciousness Explained, but it's not like he actually explains it. He just gives his own theory and understanding, but even just the way he does it just it opens your mind to how your mind works and it's amazing and the last one i'm going to recommend is sam harris's essay and i think he did it in a podcast as well called the riddle of the gun and this this is one of the one of my favorite works of his that that he, he's ever done and it's because even though i am uh you know more on the right more conservative on things i'm not a full second amendment gun uh gun enthusiast crazy person that that thing said we should you know a civilian should also have tanks and and whatnot i do believe in a certain type of gun control and i think that sam harris in that essay really lays it out i don't I don't. I would never go to the extreme of saying you should have to have like the equivalence of a pilot's license. I think that's ridiculous. But I, I just think that uh, that essay is a really good understanding of trying to take a nuanced position on a complex idea. So that's about right, it for I, me. Yeah, that's cool. I'll just say actually about that essay from Sam, Sam Harris is that essay challenged my views about guns in a way that I didn't expect. Um, 
I'm fairly liberal about guns. And yeah, uh, I recommend reading that Sam Harris essay too, but that's not my Sam Harris choice. <laughs> okay, right. so, so what I recommend from Christopher Hitchens is his memoir called Hitch 22. Um, it's my favorite memoir I've ever read. Really? Um, I haven't read that many memoirs, probably like 10, you know, I don't, I don't read memoirs that often, but it's my favorite memoir I've ever read. Um, mm -hmm. You really get to know that he was more than a, a, a mind, that he also has a body. And what I mean by that is he's traveled, like he, again, he was pro, he was pro Kurds. He wanted Kurds to have freedom. He goes to Kurdistan and he, he, he uh, multiple times, uh, he, he's traveled the world and actually tried to help different opposition groups fight for democracy around the world. Uh, he was a, you know, he was a journalist for a long time. And I just have a quick question. Where does his love for the Kurds stem from? I, I'm not aware. Like I know, I knew he had an affinity for them, but do you know where it comes from? Um, I can't recall exactly like why he initially, like, you know, initially started to care about them. I know that he, he finds them, uh, like, uh, I, he finds them like very, very civilized, and that they were sort of the underdog, and that's part of okay. the left too, right? Because he was he was a card carrying socialist for a long time, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, they were just sort of the perfect example of a people who wanted their own democratic lives, lives, and I think he just saw a lot of of like his entire worldview and ideology in them. And okay. so yeah, I recommend reading Hitch Twenty Two to get to know the man. Um, and then move on to any and everything from him because Hitchens is one of the best writers of all time. I agree. Um, so Daniel Dennett, I actually recommend his, his, there actually was a profile about him in the New Yorker that I read called Daniel Dennett's Science of the Soul. That was beautiful. And that was a beautiful was, article. Dude, it was just really, really great because Daniel Dennett is like what Nietzsche called the Superman. Like Daniel Dennett is, That's true. is <laughs> he, the, cosmo, the cosmopolitan hero like he talks about how he 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 uh he built a table out of his own workshop when he was six years old he's an avid sailor he's a farmer he whittles i don't even know what whittling is okay but he does it <laughs> he was in the coast guard too wasn't he or wasn't yeah, he, he uh, i think he was in the his no his father was in the coast guard yeah that's i'm right. not sure if he was um he was a jazz pianist in his yep. early teens mm -hmm. and uh it's just a really good it was just a great profile and that's my recommendation to start with Daniel Dennett actually is that profile about who he is as a person. He's just really, really cool down to earth guy who like, I think I like people like him and I, it makes me think of guys like Anthony Bourdain who are sort of the opposite of ide of ideological in their lives. Like they just want to do everything and they're curious <laughs> Yeah, and for sure. they have that, they have that, y that youthful vigor about them and it comes with you know, not prioritizing your own ego so much and not prioritizing any side of any, any sort of identity. And that's why I like Daniel Dennett as a person a lot. For sure. My recommendation for Richard Dawkins is the selfish gene. It is kind of dry, but I remember I read it probably seven years ago and it was just perfect. It was perfect for me at the time because I think it's a great primer on evolution and how the relative fitness of an individual in their particular environment is what one must understand about us. Mm -hmm. uh, about what fuels our passions and our instincts and even our higher order thoughts. And I'm just, I'm not someone like, I really, really like bluntness and I like, um, well, I like theories that are, that are true. Uh, and <laughs> right. it's true that it's like true. Yes, that, I do, it's as, true well. That our I do genes, as well. <laughs> right. I, yes. Uh, and like our, it's true that our genes don't care about us. <laughs> and right. it's actually, in my opinion, liberating. And it's, it's not something to sort of, to fight against and once you actually actually realize that about yourself it's so obvious and it's so interesting that it, it, that that you aren't in control of of your instincts and you aren't in control of of your desires and sometimes like again like our our, our various ideologies we have will sort of will sort of trick us about that but once we try to shed those and think of like man, like, what are my actual thoughts about things? You get closer to what evolutionary psychology says about us, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and then Sam Harris, I want to recommend Waking Up, which is a guide to spirituality without religion. I think it's his best work. I think he should focus more on meditation, Buddhism, and sort of like um, the sublime and like how we can, how human beings can transcend their their everyday lives. And because he, he does it in a way that's, yeah, not that you... you in, in a completely natural way and I think mm -hmm. we're going to start seeing more and more more and more understanding that modern neuroscience cognitive science and psychology is 
aligned with some more of the Eastern, um, Eastern um, ideas about the self and the ego. And right. I think Sam Harris is best when he, when he goes down that route and he avoids being a neocon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd have to say my only critique of that book is that it wasn't long enough. And okay. Is that I truly wanted him. I, I thought like he that book was so great because because of like you said when he when he gets into the mind and the sublime and really understanding consciousness. The, I I personally have such a fascination for that that I was sad that he didn't go into more detail. And he was asked recently if he's going to write more books or something. He's basically just like, eh, maybe, but probably not mm, okay. be, because he can he can reach so much more here. But I I really want a full thought out like you know three to four hundred page sam harris book on meditation and the self and the mind and free will and all of that more philosophical mixed with his neuroscientific background i i personally want a treatise on the theory of the mind from sam harris but uh okay right that, that, yeah. that, that's just me as a you know as a listener <laughs> right so, all right so one quick note before we wrap things up is that we have just created a new soundcloud account and we are going to be on the platforms that you normally listen to podcasts on so currently as of this recording we are on stitcher but our platform or i'm sorry but we have sent into itunes google play and tune in and i believe overcast as well so just uh, keep watch for that as that is going to be coming within a few days and that's about it for me. You can find me tweeting at Mike Skinner, Mike, S-K-I-N-N-N-E-R. Yeah, okay. And you can find me at Patrick F-O on Twitter. And my blog is icriticaltheory.wordpress.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. You guys have a great week.